Hello there. How's it going? It's been a minute since I've done a read stream. Hi, Riddy. Let me see if I can make this look a little less weird. Is that better? Hi, Riddy. Hi, Susan. How are you doing? It's wonderful to see you. Um, I'm going to be reading this book. This book that was gifted to me. Um, Tara got me this book because I do like the Game Grumps. And uh, this book is affiliated with them. Um, so, you know. Uh, so I, I, I decided to read it on, on the stream. Just to, to see how it goes. So I have not read this. Um, this will be blind to us all at the same time. Whoa! Aren't you nice? Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Hello, Puffy. Thank you so much for subbing for 18 months. I appreciate you. Um, hopefully the music is at an okay volume. Let me know if it is not. Um, but yes, this is the first official novel from the Game Grumps. Um, and I'm really excited to read this. Um, I don't know if you guys know anything about this book, but basically Dr. Cecil H.H. H. Mills is not a real person. He is a character that Aaron Hansen um created and he's supposedly Aaron's like great uncle or whatever that wrote this book but he's not actually a person it's just Aaron um but it's pretty funny it's free I'm freezing it's so cold over here we're in winter yeah um I hope that you can cozy up with something warm to drink and some nice blankets or something and that will help um so since I don't know the pacing of this book, um, I am going to just go for a little while until I kind of feel like I'm at a good stopping point or I start to get really tired or maybe like if my voice starts to give out. Um, but that being said, we'll go ahead and get started. So cozy down in. I'm going to start with the forward. Hi, my name is Erin. I'm Dr. Cecil H.H. H. Mills' nephew on my mom's side, and I want to say right up front, I do not want to do this. My uncle is a terrible man. He never calls or asks me how I'm doing, and the only time he does call is when he needs something from me. For example, promoting his book on my popular YouTube channel or showing up unannounced to my house when he needs a place to stay in order to do interviews in California with whatever nothing radio show he paid to book. A stronger Aaron would not help this horrible man with his uninspired cash-grabbing endeavors, but because I love my mom, and because she consistently asked me to look at it from his perspective, and remember when everybody said no to you when you were trying to get your art out there, even though when I frequently asked him to help me get jobs, he told me, art is struggle, that is life, and no one will hire a boy as sticky as you. I caved and I did what she asked. I consider it one of my life's biggest regrets, especially now, as my first words ever in a published novel will be about my terrible uncle. This book is written for one reason and one reason only. Money. My uncle does not care about young adults, as evidenced by when I fell off my bike at age 11 in front of him, crying out for help because I thought I had broken a bone, and he responded, A broken bone would do you good, boy. I find it especially ironic that this book is getting a soft cover version as well, since my uncle always told me soft cover books were the printings of housewives and toddlers. He would constantly, he would consistently stab the soft covers of our books with a bowie knife that he kept on him at all times in order to make a point of how they don't protect anything and how meager we've all become, comfortable in our air-conditioned three-bedroom coffins. I never got to read my school's copy of The Catcher in the Rye because it was stabbed all the way through, but my uncle told me that it was fine because it was a book in the intersection between a pop-up and those thin ones with the sound effect buttons. I don't think my principal believed me when I told him this and I had to attend after-school counseling for three weeks. My mom told me to talk about how great this book is and how the story really grabs you, and so I have just now. She mentioned something about how the characters are fun and there is a great dynamic between the brothers, so I'm just going to have to trust her on that one. Uh, personally, I've never read this, as I haven't read any of my uncle's works. I recall a time when I showed him some of my art and he crumpled it up right in front of me and told me to get used to the incessant criticism of your art by anyone and everyone. I was three. Anyway, I hope this, I guess at this point I should say I hope you enjoy this book, but I sincerely hope you do not. 
Maybe it would be the final straw for my uncle to realize that what he's been doing has been hurting his family and everyone around him. I don't know. Then again, he's absolutely the kind of guy who would experience failure, go ballistic over it, and then channel that energy into yet another seething book about, like, Tibetan cockfighting or something. With this sentence, I'm at the 630-word minimum the publisher gave me, so bye. Aaron Ego Raptor Hansen. Game Grumps, Dr. Cecil's nephew. So that's the prologue. <laughs> hey, Brittany. Hey, Terror. I bet Aaron is very stinky. Oh, look at my grinding message from the other day. Let me turn that off. That ended up not... It didn't matter anyway. Because my stuff borked. Best to save. Aaron doesn't seem to be the type to read anything but TV dinner directions. Yeah, you're probably right. Let's continue. Introduction. People seem to place a lot of importance on first sentences in books, so I will put this right here so we can avoid that altogether. Hello, dear reader. It's your old friend, Dr. Cecil H.H. H. Mills, celebrated wordsmith and oftentimes controversial figurehead in the literary world. You're no doubt browsing through this novel in the young adult section of your bookstore, so you may not have heard of my work before. You see, I'm used to having my books placed in the adult fiction section. While I may not have done much or any research on what exactly constitutes a young adult reader, I assume that since my old books were placed above a normal human adult's shoulder height, they must have been unreachable to you, which is fine. My adult books are very good books, okay? So good that I was inevitably unrestricted by form or marketability. I received carte blanche to let fire flow from my fingers and beauty seep from my pores. It was glorious, the work I could do in my thousand-page tombs. The page was my medium and truth was my ink. Then some things happened that I don't really want to talk about and gambling debts being what they are, I found myself taking whatever work the publishers would buy from me. So here I am, writing a mystery book for adolescent readers. And not a nuanced examination of human humanity's descent into the comforting, venomous clutches of technology as the myth of the American dream fades away. I didn't even want to write that anyway. No siree. Okay, kid, go take this book up to the cashier and buy it so we can get started. I'll wait. Are we good? Did you pay for this? Great. Now, before we begin the story of the Ghost Hunters Adventure Club, I think it's important that something be said about the Watts brothers, the co-founders of said club. Not about their past, mind you, which remains relatively unimportant and partially expunged from police records thanks to their both recently turning 18. I wish instead to talk about them now, in the present, in the hopes that it might give you a hint as to why they do what they do. Perhaps the best way to achieve that is to paint a portrait of them in a specific moment at a specific time. Currently, JJ and Valentine Watts are puttering up a frigid mountain road as fast as their decades-old motorcycle beneath them will allow. JJ, the eldest by a short amount of time, is at the handlebars and is just barely keeping them from careening into a snowbank. He has a scar across the bridge of his nose. He doesn't like to talk about how he got it. Valentine, glasses fogged, clings for dear life behind him while he tracks the minute-by-minute -minute loss of feeling in his fingers. He had full use of them once, for most of his life, actually. Riding up a winding road into increasingly inclement conditions is an abstract, rough existence that is a statistical outlier to his usual, more terrestrial, rough existence. The motorcycle will be ignored after the first couple minutes of the story, however, it's worth knowing that it was received as rem remuner remuneration following a game of dice and a short fist fight. Valentine shouts something that JJ either can't hear or chooses not to. Probably something about his fingers. Neither are equipped for a ride up to higher altitude wearing matching sweaters for a reason that will be deduced later by someone smarter than them. They're almost to where they are going. Now I'll stop here as I feel that might be outstaying my welcome. And that's probably a good primer on these brothers, which, and I can't believe I almost got to say this, but it's a little dubious as to whether or not they're actually brothers in the first place, but that will be definitively figured out some other time. That all being said, it's time to begin the tale of the Watts boys and their crime-solving organization, the Ghost Hunters Adventure Club. Now allow your humble narrator to see if he can shut his trap for a minute, switch elegantly to past tense, and let the brothers do the talking. <clears throat> Hi, Paige. I don't know if this Cecil guy is really a doctor. Well, he's not an actual person, so. <laughs> All right, so that was the introduction. Now we will dive into the real story, but I would just like a little bit of confirmation to make sure that the music is at okay 
volumes. Like, comparatively to my voice, I guess. You can barely hear the music. Okay. Do I need to turn anything up? Oh, okay, okay, okay. So everything's good? Okay, cool. Then we'll get started. Here's a picture. Chapter one, an explosive beginning. JJ and Valentine Watts dismounted their motorcycle. Remembering that they had traded the kickstand kick for gas at the base of the mountain, JJ laid it gingerly on the snowy pavement near a row of sports cars that might have been driven up in better weather. Before them stood the Grand Chateau, a snowy escape overlooking the cascading mountains a short drive away from Harborville, the boy's hometown. A warm glow was emanating from its windows. Valentine immediately tucked his hands into the armpits of his powder blue sweater. Perhaps he'd keep his fingers after all. Hmm, said Valentine. What is it? asked JJ, shaking the frost off of his red sweater. Well, for a place called the Grand Chateau, don't you think it's kind of... regular sized? Come on, we'll be late. Said JJ. If someone pays us to solve the mystery of the regular size chateau, then we'll go and solve the mystery of the regular size chateau. Do you think this guy's serious about the ghosts? asked Valentine. Does it make a difference? To me, yeah. JJ warmed up his hands by rubbing them and cupping them over his mouth. He slung his leather satchel around his shoulder. He's serious enough to pay us, and that's all that matters to me. Valentine looked up at the sky, noting the approach of dark and billowing clouds. Looks ominous, he said. They did their secret handshake and walked toward the chateau. After snaking their way through some bellhops and luggage carriers, the two entered the relative warmth of the Grand Chateau's lobby. Inside, they found a wide, regal reception room decorated wall-to-wall -wall with mounted game animal heads, hunting knickknacks, and comfy couches. There was a painting there at the far end of the room, a gargantuan one, of a man cradling an ornate hunting rifle, a bested black bear lying lifeless at its feet. Chateau patrons milled around, some lounging and some returning from their ski trips down the mountain. It was barely noon, and the bartender was already handing out complimentary glasses of wine as she laughed with the hotel patrons. She had short red hair and an apparently affable demeanor, as far as either of them could tell from this far away. The boys paused for a moment to stop shivering, then located the front desk and stood patiently behind an older man with a ponytail and sunglasses wearing nothing but a bath towel. Listen, said the man to the clerk. I'm not happy that I'm currently in a hotel lobby in a towel and that up until a few seconds ago I didn't even have the towel, but sometimes a man takes his breakfast tray out of his bedroom without thinking too far into the future and sometimes he forgets to bring his hotel key. The clerk had her nose buried in a novel. Appearing close in age to the brothers and wearing a pair of glasses that could make Valentine jealous, she gave nods and mm hmms at regular intervals to create the illusion of sympathy. If I could just get a new... Without looking up, the woman handed the man a new key. He marched off in a huff, snagging a glass of complimentary wine for the trip upstairs. JJ sidled up to the counter and produced a business card. This was his time to shine. How do you do, he said. My name is JJ Watts, and the less handsome gentleman behind me is my brother and close confidant, Valentine Watts. Together we make up the Ghost Hunters Adventures Club, Harborville's foremost crime-fighting and mystery-solving duo. JJ paused for a reaction. The young woman gave him gave him and Valentine a cursory glance before returning to her book. He retracted the business card, peering over the desk to better see the woman engrossed in her novel. He coughed politely, trying to get her attention. What, um, what are you reading? No, you're not, replied the young woman. Excuse me? Brothers, you're, you're not brothers. Taken aback, J.J. furrowed his brow. Now wait a minute. Look, said the woman, closing her book and adjusting her glasses. You have black hair and brown eyes, and your brother has blonde hair and blue eyes. That is rare, but not impossible. But then I noticed that you have detached earlobes while your brother doesn't. Another gen genetic dissimilarity. If you want to play the Punnett Square game to even the odds, I could see if either of you could roll your tongue. Hey, hey, slow down, said JJ. There's plenty of different ways we could be brothers. We could be adopted siblings, for all you know. Right. See, that's what I was looking for. Instead of maintaining that you were brothers, you brought up more hypotheticals. 
You've been thinking about what someone would say if they accused you of not being brothers. She leaned forward, a curt smile appearing on her lips. That, combined with the matching sweaters, which I'll add your, f your friend forgot to take the price tag off of. Valentine ripped the tag dangling from his wrist and stuck it in his back pocket, embarrassed. Leads me to deduce that you're not actually brothers, and you're probably just doing this for the bit. Or the brand. Seems like you guys are trying to make some money. JJ stood there in shocked silence. And the book is Bones of Desire, by Wallace P. Gross, said the woman as she leaned back and began reading again. Real page-turner of a sleuth story. JJ's senses returned to him and he pointed a finger at the woman. Now listen here, you little- Whoa, let me apologize for my dear brother, said Valentine, jumping between the two. He was raised by wild animals and failed out of finishing school because he started a fight club. Did you say you were reading Wallace P. Gross? Mm-hmm. He's here who- He's who we're here to see. Oh, yeah, said the woman. He writes out of the chateau. His stuff's pretty good, too, if a little on the nose. JJ folded his arms and scoffed. I'm sure he's a fine author, but he's no C Dr. Cecil H.H. H. Mills. Now there's a letter pusher. There's a footnote. Editor's note. We were contractually obligated to keep this nod to the author in the book. <laughs> Gentlemen, said a voice from behind them. The brothers turned around to see an older woman in a sharp business suit and a sour look. Her lapel was embroidered with the logo of the establishment. She extended her manicured hand in greeting. Madame Fournier, hotelier of the Grand Chateau, at your service. It's sort of regular sized, isn't it? Remarked Valentine. Hmm? JJ accepted the woman's hand. Please excuse my brother's manners, ma'am. He was a transitory circus performer during his formative years. JJ reproduced the business card. J.J. Watts, the better half of the Watts brothers and lead investigator of the Ghost Hunters Adventure Club, charmed to make your acquaintance. I'm glad you two were able to make it in time before the blizzard struck, she said, accepting and regarding the card with a manner that seemed to give them more credit than they deserved. If you were out there for another couple minutes, you surely would have frozen to death. Danger is a core tenet of the Ghost Hunters Adventure Club lifestyle, said J.J. As is neglecting to check the weather report before making a long-distance trip, added Valentine. Now, pardon my manners, said Madame Fournier, but I couldn't help but overhear that you were looking for a Mr. Wallace Pigros. Yes, said Valentine. He asked us to come up here to discuss business. Very well, then. Let me show you up to his study. Madame Fournier led the boys up the grand staircase at the end of the lobby and down a long hallway. JJ tried to sneak in one last hateful glare to the young woman at the front desk, but her nose was still buried in her book. Mr. Gross has been a guest of ours for a long while, Madame Fournier told them. He always comes up to the chateau to work on his mystery novels, which you might know have garnered him worldwide acclaim. He always comes up here? asked JJ. Yes, he's a bit of a superstitious type. He wrote his first novel here decades ago and refuses to work anywhere else. He's been at the latest manuscript for the past three years. The hotelier stopped at the large set of wooden doors and turned to the boys. I must warn you, however, that Mr. Gross has gotten on in his years and has become a little eccentric. How so? asked Valentine. Well, to start, he just called up two ghost hunters to meet him at a hotel in the mountains. Ghost hunters and super sleuths, JJ cut in. We will do landscaping too if there is a paycheck in it. Right. Well, just be warned. The double door swung open with an audible squeak and in the center of the room was an old man with frazzled gray hair that stood on end. He stood there looking distinguished with a tweed vest and knotted bow tie. The ghost hunters adventure club, he explained exclaimed, sorry. Please, please, come in. Madame Fournier took her leave as J.J. and Valentine entered the study, their senses flooding with the smell of rolled tobacco and old hardcovers. The room was lined with bookshelves and enormous arched windows overlooking the snowscape outside. Wallace P. Gross walked a circle around the room, gesticulating with an artistic flourish. J.J. and Valentine Watts, Harborville's finest brother detectives and private investigators, no job too small or too great. You've read our website, I see, said J.J., I have. You two are the brightest minds that Harborville has to offer, yes? Either that or the most search engine optimized, said Valentine. I'm sorry, what? JJ coughed. He meant to say that we are unparalleled in our brightness. We are brightness all-stars. The brightest. Too bright, some might argue. Wallace rubbed his chin, thinking. Hmm, right. You'll have to do then. In that case, I must give you the tour. Wallace P. Gross grabbed his coat and started forward. The boys followed behind dutifully, and the three stepped out into the hall. First on the docket, Wallace began, I'd like to introduce you two to the Grand Chateau. 
It's a place I've called home for the past three years now and a place I've called home many times throughout my life and career. Built over a century ago, this sec sanctuary was initially meant for Harborville's wealthy elite and urban society socialites to unwind from their busy city lives and indulge in their opium-fueled cableistic indulgences. JJ and Valentine shared a glance. They had non-opium-fueled cableistic indulgences too, although that's less important. The trio rounded a corner and walked into a room filled floor to ceiling with books. Gigantic tomes lay stacked on tables throughout and from the many stained glass windows, the boys could see snow coming down at a steadier and steadier rate. The library, Wallace said. That starts with an L, mind you. The boys, while maybe not smart enough to understand many things, were at least smart enough to know that the word library started with the letter L. They exchanged a confused look. Wallace went on. Home to a variety of first editions, encyclopedia, religious texts, and so forth. When not in my study, it is here I do all of my research for my pantheon of best-selling and award-winning mystery novels. It looks very... bookly. J.J. commented. Astute observation. Please, please, there's more to see. Wallace ushered the boys down the stairs and out through the back side of the chateau. They walked out into what must have been a vast and beautiful garden, were it not covered in snow. J.J. and Valentine immediately began shivering in their store-bought non-woolen sweaters. Wallace did not appear to mind the cold. Valentine could see the mountain drop off into a sheer cliff just beyond the winter-worn forest, and a green storage shed stood in the distance. Clearing snow in front of its doorway was whom he presumed to be the groundskeeper. Even from this distance, he could tell that this man stood a head taller than the average man. The courtyard, he said. That starts with the letter C. Are you remembering all of this? It is really cold out here, said Valentine, his teeth beginning to chatter. A smile spread across Wallace P. Gross's face. Perfect. The boys followed Wallace down a snowy path. An old woman in a fur coat and a black scarf sat on a bench next to a stone statue of an angel. She didn't seem to mind the cold either. Looking up at them, her face turned from a scowl to a deeper, more pronounced scowl. If it isn't my intellectually impotent ex-husband, the woman said. Don't look her in the eyes, boys, Wallace warned, the smile sliding from his face. You will turn to stone. J.J. and Valentine glanced at Wallace, trying to assess the validity of his statement. J.J., Valentine, I'd like to introduce you to my ex-wife and perennial thorn in my side, Marcella P. Gross. Wait, interrupted Valentine. You have the same middle initial? I took it the same way I took half this man's fortune in the divorce, snapped Marcella. Valentine gulped. Your sense of humor remains sharp, said Wallace. Whose soul did you sell for it? What? said JJ, trying to diffuse the situation. What, um, are you doing out here in the snow, ma'am? It's getting pretty cold out here. She wanted to be in a place where her heart felt warm, no doubt. What are you doing out here, Wallace, finally looking for a spot to keel over and die? I'll die when I'm good and ready, you frigid ice queen. Come on, boys. Wallace marched toward the chateau. It was nice to meet you, ma'am, said Valentine. Get lost, Jack. They entered again through the backside of the chateau where Wallace led them through another hallway. I hope that this isn't being too forward, sir, JJ said. But what's your ex-wife doing here at the chateau? You're asking questions that aren't important right now, Mr. Gross replied. He paused for a moment, as if he were either lost in thought or his old man programming had encountered a bug. That's funny, she was sitting on the bench where we first met. He shook his head and pressed forward. Nearly there, come along. They arrived at a wide room with a vaulted ceiling. A huge chandelier hung above an intricately woven carpet. Chairs and tables, presumably used for special occasions, were stacked in a corner and also placed haphazardly throughout the room. The Grand Ballroom, or Ballroom for short, starts with the letter B. It's beautiful, isn't it? Lovely, said JJ out of politeness. I didn't want to show it for any other reason than I thought it was nice. Great for dancing. Maybe you two ought to cut a rug in here on your free time. We will put that on the docket, said JJ. Wallace P. Gross nodded vigorously, his wire-like hair swaying back and forth. Nearly finished with the tour, gents. This way? In the hallway, J.J. and Valentine hung back just out of earshot of the author. Are you getting kind of a, I don't know, a not-all-there vibe from Wallace? Whispered Valentine. Was it the casual, socialite, cabalistic ritual dialogue or the ping-pong match of death threats between him and Marcella that made you think that? J.J. sighed. Look, I'm not personally enamored by the situation at hand either, and I know what you're about to say. This isn't right, said Val. See that, I knew you were going to say that, J.J. replied. 
Look, finances being what they are, if we want to eat tonight, we're going to have to at least listen to the guy. Valentine shook his head. I don't like that. I know you don't. But if you want to make it in the detective business, you're going to have to take a few bum cases. They followed the old man back to the chateau lobby and up the stairs to Wallace's study. He closed the door behind them with another squeak from the door's hinges and stood in the center of the room. Final stop of the tour, he said. Study. Starts with an S. The boys stood there waiting for Wallace to say something more. After a moment of wordless smiling, JJ broke the silence. So how would you like us to help, Mr. Gross? Ah, yes, said Wallace, snapping back to attention. As you boys know, I needed the employ of Harborville's finest detectives for a reason. You see, he said, his fingers beginning to tremble. I'm being haunted. Right, ghosts, said JJ. My brother and I are well versed in ghost detection and expulsion. However, do keep in mind that we charge extra for poltergeists and ghosts in corporal form. You pay out of pocket if we have to bring in either an old priest or a young priest. Take more pride in listening rather than speaking, young man. Wallace's face grew grim. It might do you some good down the line. The boys looked at each other, confused. The author paced around the room, peering out of his window into what had turned into a threatening blizzard outside. I've known for some time now that a ghost has been watching me, watching over my latest work. For the past three years, I have been consumed by this obsession, this specter, unable to finish my manus manuscript. He returned to the center of the room and addressed the boys directly. He heaved a very heavy sigh. Now I fear my time is short, for I've put everything together and I can see clearly. There are a great many more mysteries to the Grand Chateau than you'd initially believe. And just as he finished his sentence, Wallace P. Gross's head exploded. What is this book? <laughs> that was chapter one. <laughs> Interesting setup. Okay, let me catch up on chat. Books, brews, and booze, welcome to the channel. Thank you so much for following. I hope you're having a wonderful night or day or whatever time of day it is where you are at. <laughs> Looking for how people are brothers and not believing them seems normal. Bones of Desire. You don't think V also did that while she worked at the hotel? Oh, read at the desk? I definitely did, but I did not ignore guests when they came up to me. <laughs> People can make all sorts of money by pretending to be brothers. Why is Mr. Gross giving me Knives Out vibes? Ah, I can see that a little bit. He likes to keep retractable knives in his room. I don't know if there's another book to this, but this is the first book. Um, okay, so there is a second book. Okay, cool. Library. Bookly. I know, I liked that. I liked, I liked him describing the library as bookly. <laughs> cool, never bond in the many way. Yeah, see what you did there, exactly. I die on my terms. Did you take half your husband's money in the divorce by pretending to be the brother of someone clearly not your brother? Hi, Rifem. How's it going? Ghosts. Normal. Yeah. Lol. What? I'm very confused too. He can see clearly now. The rain is gone, but now there's head goo. Yeah. Thank you for the claps. He can see clearly now. <laughs> yeah. There we go. Thanks so much. I love reading fellow reading fun streamers. I am a variety streamer, so I do uh, lots of different things, but I do like to do reading streams, um, uh, you know, in between like games. Um, so I have been going through, I, the first thing I read on stream was the entirety of Lemony Snicket's A Series of Unfortunate Events series. And now I've been reading through Nancy Drew books on stream, um, with occasional mix ups. Like I read, uh, the first Wayside School book by Lewis Sacker, and now I'm reading this. So I do try to mix it up sometimes, but, um, I like mysteries, so what can I say? <laughs> um, so that's that's what I focus on usually when I do reading. But I also do a lot of other things too. I do. Uh, I'm a big Nintendo fan, so I play a lot of like Pokemon and things like that. 
um, Nancy Drew games, those sorts of things. So I hope that you enjoy your time here. Yeah, the, the book emotes are really cute. Okay, so shall we continue? I'm gonna eat another bite of my little like brownie cookie that I have here. I already feel right at home. I'm so glad. Welcome in. Um, it's so fun to make new friends. Okay, let's continue on. It is not a pink lemonade polar, it's a grapefruit bubbly. But as y'all know me, I I'm always be drinking my seltzers. <laughs> I hope you guys are feeling cozy and you have something nice to drink. I thought about making myself a cup of hot tea. If I want to take a break later, I probably will go do that. Okay, here's the picture now. I assume this is head goo. I don't know. <laughs> the, ex the head explosions. Okay. Chapter 2. Deputy Park, Harborville Sheriff's Department. Deputy Park burst through the double doors of the Grand Chateau and immediately turned to close them against the roaring blizzard outside. Once he was satisfied that he'd bested the doors in fair and open combat, he kicked the snow off of his boots and brushed the icicles from the ends of his mustache. Unzipping his Harborville Sheriff Department winter jacket, he marched up the large staircase at the end of the room, where a large crowd of onlookers had gathered. Out of the way, Harborville Sheriff's Department, he shouted, parting through the sea of skiers and hotel patrons grouped shoulder to shoulder. Finally making his way to the front of the crowd, the deputy found the source of the commotion. Not you two again, Deputy Park groaned. Deputy Park, our old friend, we meet again, said J.J., he and his brother were sitting in the doorway to the study, wiping their faces and clothes with Grand Chateau monogrammed towels. Madame Fournier appeared before the deputy. Wait, you know these two? Who are you? said Park. I'm the hotelier of this establishment and the one who telephoned you, she said. Deputy Park's eyes narrowed. What's a hotelier? I'm the hotel manager. Right, Deputy Park replied, straightening up. Well, it's a wonder your call made it through with the blizzard outside and all. He motioned to the brothers on the floor. And why is the Ghost Hunters Adventure Club here? Wherever they go, trouble follows. We follow the trouble, you dingus. JJ rolled his eyes. Oh, is that true? Said Park. Because every time I... Every case I run into you two... Every case I run into you two on... Goes belly up from go. JJ shook his head. That's not true. What about the old abandoned mill? That was not our fault. The Harborville bank heist. Anyone could have mistaken that old lady for a bank robber. What about the counterfeiters of Pirate's Quay? Hey, Valentine cut in. Didn't we save your life on that one? You did, Deputy Park grumbled. But I wouldn't have been tied up in the warehouse in the first place if it weren't for you two bumbling idiots. He folded his arms and kicked at the carpet. Still, though, Mrs. Park says to send you her regards and thanks. J.J. couldn't help but smile to himself. Deputy Park readdressed Madame Fournier. So what have we got here? J.J. shot his thumb behind him toward the study. Dead rider, he said. Deputy Park turned back to J.J., shocked. Sweet Hollandaise, boys, what have you gotten yourselves into? I called you as soon as I heard the gunshot, Madame Fournier said. I found these two young gentlemen in the corner screaming when I arrived. Deputy Park surveyed the scene. In front of him was indeed a dead rider with an exploded head. At the opposite end of the room was a shattered window. Snow was starting to cover the mahogany desk in the center of the room. So what happened here? Valentine answered. After the guy talked to us for a while, he took us back to his study. We heard a gunshot, saw his head explode, and then that glass over there shattered. Did you get eyes on the shooter? Asked Deputy Park. Sorry, said JJ. There was a foreign substance in our eyes that prevented us from utilizing the gift of sight. What was that? Rider blood, said Valentine. Park surveyed the scene once more, brushing his mustache with his fingers in deep thought. I've solved the mystery, he exclaimed. Wait, really? Asked Valentine, genuinely perplexed. Sure I have, he said, pointing toward the crime scene. The broken window suggests the bullet came from outside, ending the life of our dear writer friend there. He stepped over the body and walked to the window where the blizzard roared in full force. Our killer ran away from the scene of the crime and into worsening snow conditions where he'll no doubt freeze to death and die. 
I'll have Harborville Sheriff's Department roll out here with their ice picks to excavate the perpsicle. Avenging the death of Charles Boo killed Ski over here. <laughs> the crowd stood in silence. When no one objected, Park marched to the front of the room. Welp, just gotta call this one over to headquarters so we can get a slab van to pick up Haruki murdered Kami. <laughs> <laughs> we'll all be out of here in time for dinner he spoke a few words into his walkie-talkie and waited for a response nothing he tried again only to hear static right said park new plan apparently the blizzard conditions that no doubt froze our mystery murderer have cut off radio communication with the outside world which also means that the mountain roads that once used to reach the chateau are now rendered inoperable looks like we're all stuck here until the roads are clear a shocked gasp ran through the crowd. Oh, come on, said Park. We all get to spend the weekend in a snowy mountain resort together, and there's only one dead body here, which you'll barely have to see. The killer's long gone. We don't know that, JJ shook his head. The killer could be in here right now. Young man, I will karate chop you in the throat, Deputy Park warned. <laughs> I'm sorry. In any case, the halls will be patrolled by myself. Deputy Jihoon Park of the <laughs> Harborville Sheriff's Department. He made a sweeping gesture to the crowd. No one gets killed on my watch. The crowd of hotel patrons erupted in chaos and accus accusatory questions directed toward Deputy Park of the Harborville Sheriff's Department. Madame Fournier jumped between him and the growing mob, trying to defuse the situation. Please, she pleaded. I know everyone here is upset. It goes without saying that all of your rooms will be complimentary for the duration of the blizzard. The idea of free hotel rooms quieted the crowd down a bit. A woman with short hair stepped out of the throng. Valentine recognized her as the bartender who was serving drinks when they entered the chateau earlier. Plus, we'll have more complimentary wine after dinner, she said in a thick Bostonian accent. Everyone in the crowd shrugged and Madame Fournier breathed a sigh of relief. Now wait just a second, yelled JJ, jumping in to join the crowd. My name is J.J. Watts, and the man still picking writer brain out of his ears is my brother and indispensable ally, Mr. Valentine Watts. Together we form the entity of Ghost Hunters Adventures Club, Harborville's best and arguably only ghost hunting and crime-solving organization. Here we go, groaned Deputy Park. At the time of his death, my brother and I were in the employ of Mr. Wallace P. Gross, and we will continue to honor his employment request until his killer is brought to justice. And because of this, I will not rest. He turned his attention to Madame Fournier. Until my brother and I are upgraded to a two-bed suite with meals included. Madame Fournier sighed. Fine. Uh, I'd like my room upgraded as well, said a voice. Everyone turned to see that it was the man with the sunglasses and ponytail from earlier. No, said the hotelier. He shrugged. Worth a shot. Madame Fournier began funneling the crowd out of the hallway and back down the stairs. Please, everyone, give us some space to clean up a little. I'll have our groundskeeper see what we can do to tidy up here. You all go enjoy a drink in the lounge downstairs. JJ and Valentine joined the crowd in their march, avoiding further questioning from Deputy Park. On the way down, they spotted the groundskeeper walking the opposite direction down the stairs. He did, in fact, stand a head taller than everyone else. That's the end of chapter two. I... I did not know, I, I had no, I didn't know what to expect with this book, okay? So, some of this dialogue is just, I, you know, I, I wasn't expecting it. I'm sorry for laughing <laughs> and, like, interrupting the story, but, you know, <laughs> he is dramatic. <laughs> when the moon hits your eye like some head goo on my head. <laughs> Popping in, but without, but says hi without sound anyway. Hi, Coco, if you're still here. <laughs> waves soundlessly to Coco. Do, do your waves normally make a lot of noise? <laughs> I wave like a fish on land. Especially in stadiums when all the people go, Whoa! Sweet hollandaise. Yeah. <laughs> Deputy Park solves another one. This man, he's a genius. Okie dokie, see you next time. Gotta head out. Okay, bye Coco, who can't hear me say bye because you're not here anymore. Why'd you react to Perpsicle that way? Because it was funny! They were probably shooting at a wolf and missed. Deputy Park giving Major Tino Balducci. Yeah, he's very Balducci coded. <laughs> Perpsicle Poopsicle. <laughs> Haruki 
murder Kami. Why? He just came up with that scenario because so he could say Persicle. This book is wild. I'm really enjoying this. This is fun. Only one dead body. What a deal. No one dies on my watch. That's why I take it off for cases. She couldn't take the majesty of the book. So much so she had the stream muted. She had to go right immediately. Yeah, that's true. Thank you for the claps. When they tidy up the crime scene to make room for more customers. I think it's supposed to be funny dialogue. Yeah. I can see the YouTube comments now. Why are you laughing? Stop interrupting the flow of the reading. That will happen to me. That will happen to me. I sometimes... So these are like the comments that I get on YouTube on my read streams. They're like... Uh, the music is too soft. Um, it would really add to the atmosphere if you, like, rose the volume of the music. And then the next comment will be, The music is so loud, it's m so distracting, and I wish you would just read. And then it's like, I wish you would stop talking to your chat between chapters. It's really distracting. And I'm like, Skip forward! Just skip forward! You can never make the internet happy. I've just come to learn that, like, you just, you literally cannot make the internet happy. It doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter what you do, who you are, what you look like, what you do, what your skills are, what, you, what you're attempting to do on the internet. It does not matter. There will be people on the internet that do not like you and will critique you anyway. So just be prepared for that if you are ever want to make content. And if you are a content creator, I'm sure you can relate because you can't make the internet happy. You just can't. <laughs> Especially the ADD children of YouTube comment sections. YouTube viewers, you have the power. Hey, future YouTube commenters, shut it. Exactly. No matter what happens, there will be that person not happy. Exactly. That hey, CJ, by the way, it's good to see you. Never putting stuff on YouTube. People on Twitch are so nice. People on Twitch are great. I, mostly. I, I will say. I've met the weirdos. But, like, um, usually people on, on Twitch are great. Because it's like you kind of develop your own community, you know? And, like, so you get to know the people that are in your chat. And, like, that you, you, you have your own vibe that you, like, set. And it's just, like, on YouTube, anybody can search your algorithm. Like, and the algorithm will just give you the, them the video. And then it's, like... I hate everything about this, but I watched it all. Literally, I, I'm pretty sure I have a video on one of the last videos, or a comment on one of the last videos of the Lemony Snicket series that I have up on YouTube. And it, somebody was like, I, I listened to this whole thing, but I really think you did a terrible job. And I'm like, then why, why did you listen? Why'd you listen to 13 books if you thought, if you hated it? Like, why, why would you, why? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> oh, God. I admit on my first two streams I was heckled, but I'd been a viewer for so long I knew that was an anomaly. Weird, yeah, I mean that happens. You're gonna get hecklers that come in sometimes. That's why it's important to have good mods. I, I appreciate and trust my mods so much. Weirdos and stalkers exist. Gotta drive, I'll catch up on the rest, maybe on YouTube and I'll complain. I mean, comment nicely. Bye, Reddy, please be safe. Please be safe driving. I'll have a wonderful time. That's when you reply with a form letter. <laughs> Probably, true. Okay, sorry, I chatted too much. Let's move on. Those are also the people who eat the whole meal and tell the wait staff they didn't like it. Exactly. Dear user, thanks for listening and enjoying my video. Your support is the most welcome. Dear fill in the blank. All right, I'm gonna keep going. Because this is a very funny book, and I want to I keep going. Okay. Chapter 3. The Bookcase. Oh, here's the picture. The real mystery we should be solving is how they got those towels to be so soft, said JJ, rolling up and stuffing as many Grand Chateau monogram towels into his satchel as he could. They were in their promised two-bed suite, an all-oak affair, adorned in vaguely rustic knickknacks and landscape paintings of the mountain. Valentine peered out of the window, which would have looked out down into the mountain road that led them here, were it not for the howling gale outside. We gotta be careful on the way out, said JJ. I gave the front desk lady a fake credit card for incidentals, but she's a sharp one. It didn't help the- I didn't help by making the last four digits 6969. He looked over at Valentine, whose mind seemed to be lost in the snow outside. What's the matter? You used to love playing steal the hotel amenities. 
Do you think Park was right? Asked Valentine. I would not trust his opinion on what to get for breakfast, let alone what he thinks about a murder investigation, said JJ. He belly flopped onto the bed and wrapped himself in high thread sh count sheets. But that doesn't matter now. What do you mean? Asked Valentine. I mean that our bankroll had his head exploded. There's no payout for us other than free room and board and whatever you and I can carry out of here undetected. Come on, JJ, you have to be at least a little curious about what's going on here. Oh, sure, I'm curious. I'm curious about how the upper crust lives. I'm curious to know a weekend without want or need. I'm curious to see if there are any loose gems or precious stones that can be pried and pocketed for later sale. He got up to examine a painting on the wall, noting that it was held in place by a security latch. I'm not, however, curious about who shot Wallace P. Gross from a sniper's position in a snowy tundra. That's the thing, said Valentine, turning his attention away from the snow. I am not so sure where that shot came from. He sat on the edge of his own bed. Try to remember back to when the head exploded. We even told it to Deputy Park. We heard the shot. The head exploded. We got rider blood in our eyes, and then we heard the glass shatter. If the shot came from outside, we would have heard the glass shatter first. All right, Sherlock, if the shot didn't come from outside, then where did it come from? I don't know, said Valentine, pointing to his eyes. Rider blood! Case closed then. Guess we gotta go back to a pampered weekend in a snowy mountain escape. Valentine furrowed his brow. If I could just get back to the scene of the crime, I could find out for sure. This isn't gonna get you- This isn't going to get out of your head, is it? Said JJ. No, and I won't stop talking about it, effectively ruining your weekend plans. All right, JJ sighed. If we can sneak in there tonight and look around, will you let me enjoy the rest of the weekend? I'll even help you strip some copper wire out from the walls. Then it's settled, said JJ. The Ghost Hunters Adventure Club is back on the case, if only for tonight. The two did their secret handshake to seal the deal. The boys waited until midnight before they left the room with JJ's trusted lockpick kit. By this time, they assumed Deputy Park would be done with his rounds, and they made their way from their room, down the elevator, and over to Wallace's study unperturbed. JJ knelt on the floor and unfurled his kit while Valentine kept watch at the end of the hall. Selecting the right tensioner and scraping tool was an art that JJ had long ago mastered. He inserted the tools, ready to work. The door creaked open. Right, said JJ, another lock successfully picked. Valentine abandoned his lookout post and joined JJ, where they opened the door and entered with caution, cringing at the squeak of the door as it continued to alert everyone in the hotel to their whereabouts. The body of Wallace P. Gross was missing. The boy stood there for a moment trying to deduce what had happened. Guess they must have moved him, Valentine concluded. Unless he wasn't even dead in the first place and his headless body now roams these hallways searching for a new head. Valentine shot a glance at his brother. I mean, what if? asked JJ. They stepped over the bloody spot where Wallace's body had been and stood in the center of the room. It was covered in a layer of snow thanks to the broken window at the opposite end of the study. All right, Inspector hates fun, said JJ. Work your magic. Valentine went to the window and examined the shards of glass at the bottom of the frame. See, I was right. Valentine pointed to the floor beneath the window pane. If the shot had come from outside, there would have been glass fragments on this side of the window. Instead, it must have been shattered from inside while you and I were blinded by rider blood. But why would they do that? Maybe to throw us off the trail, to make us think the killer went off and died in a snowstorm. Maybe to make us not wonder if the kill came from inside the house. JJ was shivering from the cold. Look around, we're in a tiny rider's study. Where else could the shot have come from? Valentine adjusted his glasses, examining the room. He walked over to the large oak desk that stood as the centerpiece of the room. That's odd, he said. What? Valentine brushed away the layer of snow that covered the desk, revealing a stack of books next to Wallace's typewriter and read aloud, Harborville, a tourist guide, an oral history of Grand Mountain, advanced spelunking techniques. Was this research material for Wallace's new book? JJ walked over to the desk and opened the drawers. You ever know a writer type to break a lock and then empty out his drawers? He asked. Why? Because these locks are broken and it looks like the drawers have been emptied. Wouldn't Wallace have kept his manuscript here? I guess so, replied Valentine. Hmm. JJ had a thought. He went over to the blood spot on the floor and faced his brother. Val, if you and I got covered in rider blood, then that means his head must have exploded toward us. That means the bullet, bullet must have struck Wallace from behind. JJ turned around and examined the wall by the entrance to the study, feeling over the wallpaper with his fingers. 
There, he exclaimed before remembering that someone might hear him. This is where the bullet is lodged. He pointed to a small hole near the, near the frame of the door. Almost went through one of us. The bullet flew between our heads before we got brain bits in our eyes. JJ stood by the bullet hole and turned around. Closing one eye and pointing with a finger, he chased the trajectory of the bullet. It looks like the shot came from that bookshelf over there? Valentine turned to examine the floor-to-ceiling oak bookshelf filled to the breaking point with leather-bound volumes. What does that mean? It means we caught the culprit. Cuff him, Val. This bookcase will never kill again. If what you're saying is true, then there must be something behind the bookcase. Come on, help me. With what? Pull on books. One might open this thing. You have got to be kidding me. That only happens in movies, said JJ as he pulled on a book that caught a latch and caused the entire bookcase to swing open on a, sh on a hinge. He shrugged. I stand corrected. Valentine inspected the bookcase in the darkened pathway behind it. I wonder where it goes. Me too. Well, shame that the mystery of the hidden passageway will never get solved. Come on, Val, let's pack it up. What do you mean? We found where the killer took the shot. We gotta go investigate. JJ massaged the scar across his nose. Not happening, bud. I've, paid unplayed, I've played unpaid detective for long enough. And to be truthful with you, I don't even think an honest salary would get me to go down the hallway. I'm going whether you're coming or not, said Valentine. Feel free to hang out alone in this spooky study with the blood stain. Fine, fine, said JJ, but if this turns out to be a ghost with a gun, I will never forgive you. Val led JJ past the bookcase and into a stone passageway barely large enough for them to sidle through. Moisture from the air had frosted onto the stones around them. They could see their breath. I think I got a cobweb in my mouth, said JJ. This passageway must run through the building, said Valentine. Or maybe it leads to another exit on the other side of the chateau, but why was it built? Wallace did say this building was constructed over a hundred years ago. Maybe it was for the opium, said JJ, running into more spider webs. The boys continued down the passageway, traversing over cracked stone and rotten woodwork. They could hear faint voices above and around them. The passageway split into different directions just ahead. Which way do we go? asked JJ. I guess we follow the sound of the voices. JJ sighed. Ahead of them, a slat at the top of the passageway cast a beam of light through the dust. That's where it's coming from, said Valentine. Give me a boost. JJ cupped his hands for Valentine to put his foot into and lifted him up. It's a grate, I think, said Valentine. He peered through the slat to see that he was looking into the ballroom Wallace had shown them on the tour. In the center of the room were two figures. Peering closer, he made out Wallace's ex-wife and the ponytailed man with the sunglasses. What's happening? asked JJ, struggling to keep Valentine aloft. Shh, Marcella P. Gross and the ponytail guy seem to be mad about something. Valentine listened intently. The ponytail man was pacing around the room, his arms just gesticulating wildly. Marcella was sitting on a chair by a banquet table, coldly smoking a cigarette indoors. She took a long drag and puffed it in his direction. "'People have been suspicious of us,' she said. "'They've always been suspicious of us.' "'Will you just keep a level head?' Ponytail said, sweating profusely. "'If you and me just keep quiet and lay, loo lay low, we will get through this just fine.' "'Something juicy is happening,' Valentine whispered down to JJ. "'I'm losing feeling in my fingers,' JJ replied." Valentine turned his attention back to the conversation happening in the ballroom. Let's make sure we're not seen together for the rest of our stay here, Ponytail said. There should be enough to throw people off the scent. What do you want me to do then? asked Marcella. Should I go into open mourning for my ex-husband? She put out her cigarette directly on the table. Maybe wear more black than you usually do. That could not hurt. Valentine looked down again at JJ. I think these two might have had something to do with Wallace's murder. JJ grunted. I'm dying down here. Just a couple more seconds. We might find out something more useful. Just then, JJ heard the telltale squeak of the door to Wallace P. Gross's office. Someone's coming! Ponytail snapped to attention. What was that? Uh-oh, said Valentine. JJ, be quiet. Instead of replying, JJ's grip broke and Valentine came tumbling down in a loud thud that echoed down the passageway. Hey, who was that? Came the voice of the man from the ballroom. Valentine got off of got up off of JJ and dusted himself off. What the- he whispered. We were about to solve the mystery. We gotta go, said JJ. Come on. J- oh no. JJ led him back down the dark hallway, shimmying as fast as he they could and ignoring whatever spider webs got into their mouth. A hand reached out of the darkness and struck JJ directly on the nose, sending him falling backward into Valentine. Ow! 
J.J. looked up to find the young woman from the front desk earlier today. She looked scared, ready to strike again. What are you doing here? She demanded. Why'd you hit me in the nose? J.J. demanded back. What are you doing here? Also demanded Valentine. The woman lowered her fists. I, I started wondering about the murder because the deputy's assessment didn't add up. I came to the study. I found the bookcase was open, so I walked in and found you guys here. It didn't add up for us either, said Valentine. The glass was shattered from inside the room, so the bullet didn't come from the outside. That's what I thought. You said you saw his head explode and then you heard the glass shatter. That's the same deduction we came to. Look, everyone, interrupted JJ. I'm really glad we're all bonding over fine detective work. But we just made a lot of noise and I think made some of the hotel patrons aware of our existence back there. We should probably make ourselves scarce. JJ sidled past them toward the study, stopped, and then turned to the woman. Also, we are still not cool, you and me. They arrived at the study, closed the bookcase, and headed toward the hallway, closing the large double doors behind them. Great. J.J. pinched his nose to stem the flow of blood. Now we just get back to our rooms, shut the door, put this horror show of a day to bed. Hey, if anyone's out there, you should know I have a gun and I'm trained in the art of shooting it. It's Deputy Park, Valentine hissed. Down the long end of the hallway, a shadow rounded the corner. We gotta hide. Follow me, said the young desk clerk. She dashed forward and led them down the grand staircase. She dove under the reception desk in the lobby and the boys followed close behind. A moment later, a beam of light shone over the desk. We are still not cool, J.J. gasped, trying to catch his breath. And you're certain you heard a commotion come from over here? Oh, wrong voice. And you're certain you heard a commotion come from over here? Came a voice they recognized as Deputy Parks. Clear as day, said another. That sounds like Ponytail Guy, whispered Valentine. You mean Mr. Newberry, said the young woman. Will you two please quiet down before we get caught? J.J. hissed. Hey, kill her! Deputy Park called. If you're here, please come out with your hands up. It's far too spooky right now to be searching every nook and cranny for you. After a few moments of silence, the flashlight sweep stopped. Welp, sorry, bud. No killers here, Deputy Park concluded. Might be ghosts, but that's well above my pay grade. Anything spiritually paranormal is something I guarantee you don't guarantee you I don't handle well. The trio waited until long after the footsteps faded off into the distance before they made their way to the elevator. When it reached their floor, J.J. pointed at the young woman. Forget our faces, he said. He and Valentine walked to the safety of their own room. Valentine closed the door behind them. That was far too close, said J.J., wrapping himself up in a blanket. There's no way you're ever getting me to do something like that again. Don't you care at all that the real killer's still on the loose? And what sort of shady deal was going on with Marcella and what's his name, the Newberry fellow? Please, Valentine, do us both a favor and just shut your brain off for a minute. It's been a long day, and I'm eager to solve the mystery of what's it like to get eight hours of sleep. Wait, said Valentine. Why didn't the study door squeak when we closed it? End of chapter three. Dear user, kiss me bum. Yeah, exactly. No payout, regular Nancy Drew case. I'm just joining, so I imagine, I'm imagining this is J.J. Ling and Dirk Valentine. You got it. You got it, man. That's it. The best maybe brothers. The deputy is Tino Balducci, for sure. By the way, when was this written? Yeah, just the last few years. Let me look. Copyright, um... The hardcover came out in 2020, the um, paperback 2021. It's a great, said Valentine. A great what? Surprises. CJ is actually Dr. Cecil. Yeah. Thank you for shouting out CJ and Paige. Deputy Park did it again. <laughs> I think Deputy Park is funny. He might be my favorite character so far. <laughs> Who is Dr. Cecil? The author. He's not an actual person. Um, this book was written. Dr. Cecil H.H. H. Mills is a character that Aaron of the Game Grumps, which I don't know if you're familiar with that channel, but if you're familiar with the a shot in a mist like meme about uh, White Wolf Bicycle Creek, that was from when the Game Grumps played White Wolf Bicycle Creek. Um, so Aaron of the Game Grumps, he created this character, Dr. Cecil H.H. H. Mills, and wrote this book as him. So... It's a little bit complicated, but that's the story. Modern but trying to be vintage in a way. I see that you're all enjoying my book. 
Yeah, Aaron basically created his uncle, yeah. I have a knot in my hair right here and it's like really bothering me. Okay. Un untangle my heel. Okay. I assume the music is still okay because nobody's yelled at me about it. Thank you. What if not was pronounced like Kmart? Cannot. That's cannot fun. Okay. Shall we move on? The music is both good and terrible, depending on whom you ask on YouTube in the future. True. All these years, you've been saying cannot? Like, man, these ship cannots are really tricky. <laughs> Please double cannot my shoe la laces. Okay, anyway, here's the picture for chapter four. Chapter four, breakfast. JJ poured another heaping glob of maple syrup onto his pancakes. It blows my mind sometimes how these fat cats live. Did you know there's other types of boilings than hard? They get to choose the boiledness of their eggs. These bunch of elitists. He glanced over <laughs> at his brother opposite him in the booth. They were in the Grand Chateau's only restaurant, yet another log cabin themed space with plenty of dead animal heads adorning the walls. Between them lay a breakfast for five. Valentine barely picked at his scrambled eggs. What's the matter? asked JJ. Your Canadian bacon's getting cold. Valentine frowned. The clues are just not adding up. Oh, this again. JJ rolled his eyes and accepted a refill of coffee from a passing waitress. What happened to the all American institution of breakfast? Do these hash browns mean nothing to you? I bet even Sherlock Holmes himself had respect for his sunny side ups. Sherlock Holmes was English? Would have made a fine American the way he ate those eggs. Look, said Valentine, so much of this is not making sense. Why did Wallace have that book about spelunking on his desk? Why does this place have secret passageways? Who's going around fixing squeaky door hinges in the middle of the night? Based on what we know, there's still a killer on the loose here at the Grand Chateau, and I'm sorry to tell you this, dear brother, but the whole mystery of it all is affecting my appetite. JJ put down the strip of bacon he was eating inside. All right, Val, you want to get into it? Let's get into it. You and I, two sleuths who, despite talking a big game, have never actually cracked a case, get called up to a snowy resort fortress up in the mountains by an old man with rapidly declining mental faculties, he croaks, and the killer is still on the loose. Now, I have it on good authority that the kind of guys who go looking for killers run the occupational hazard of getting killed themselves. So now I'm caught between two diverging paths. One where I go looking for trouble in pursuit of a non-existent paycheck, and the other where I mind my own business and spend a relaxing, relaxing weekend at a place where if you finish all of the bread in the basket, a waiter will bring you a new basket of bread for free without you even asking. So eat your breakfast, gumshoe. All of a sudden, a book slammed down on the table in the only place that didn't have food on it. The boys looked up to see the front desk clerk from the night before. You again, JJ exclaimed. I thought I we told you to kick rocks. Shut up, said the young woman. This is important. She tapped the cover of the book. An oral history of Grand Mountain said Valentine. That's the book that was on Wallace's desk. I thought it was strange he was reading this, so I went back this morning and snagged it on my rounds. Turns out that when John Henry Grand originally built this place- Wait, interrupted Valentine. This place was named after a person? Yes, John Henry Grand. So the name of this chateau has nothing to do with the size of it? No, what are you getting at here? Let me apologize for my brother, JJ cut in. His favorite game as a child was hit the wall with your head? In any case, we just solved the mystery of the regular sized chateau. The woman sighed. Let me back up. A hundred years ago, this mountain was trailblazed by the wealthy and world-renowned explorer John Henry Grand. 
It was on this mountain that he built this very chateau that we're all stuck in today. She flipped the book open to a full-size picture of a grisly yet distinguished mountaineer covered in layers of fur standing at the peak of a mountain. Hey, said Valentine, it's the guy in the painting you see when you walk in. Right, said the young woman, but here's the thing. Something happens in his later years and he goes from wealthy socialite to antisocial hermit. He renounces his wealth and status, goes into hiding, and dies alone in his own private Xanadu. Decades later, this place reopens as a quaint luxury resort. So what's the big deal? asked JJ. This mountain has a long and storied history of old men losing their marbles. The big deal is what Wallace P. Gross was trying to figure out. Oh great, another mystery. The woman glanced over her shoulder to make sure no one was listening, then leaned toward the two. Wallace P. Gross was searching for treasure. JJ's ears perked up. Treasure? I think. See, John Henry Grand renounced his wealth, sure, but no one knows where that money went. Official documents say that it went to charity and his family members, but reading between the lines, you can tell something is fishy. How so? asked Valentine. Wallace P. Gross was not the first person to die on Grand Mountain, said the young woman. She pulled out another book, Advanced Spelunking Techniques. That was on Wallace's desks, too, said Valentine. I thought it was strange he was reading this. Maybe he needed it as a research for his new book. But then I got to thinking, and I went up and looked... I went and looked up the statistics on mountaineering-related deaths on Grand Mountain. Surprise, it's abnormally high. She shut both of the books and leaned in further still. I think the treasure, or whatever Gross was looking for, is hidden somewhere on Grand Mountain, and everyone who's gone searching for it has died. Did their heads explode too? asked JJ. No, and that's where it gets interesting. All of these mountaineering deaths can be accounted for, mostly adventurers out of their depth going off trail and falling their, to their demise. Wallace was different. He wrote mysteries, so it's pretty clear he liked solving mysteries. I think he was trying to crack a code. That's a bit of a jump, said JJ with a raised eyebrow. Wallace and I were friends. I liked reading his books, and he liked talking to me about them. He'd give me copies and even quiz me on things after I read them. And, JJ prompted, and then I caught a glimpse of his manuscript. Wallace had been at the book for the last three years, and rumor around the chateau was that he'd barely even started it. He was usually extremely secretive about whatever he was working on in there, but this one time I was in his study talking to him, and he just had his manuscript out in the open. What did you see? asked Valentine. Only the title, The Secret of the Grand Chateau. That could be anything, JJ scoffed, but it could be something. Wouldn't you agree it's worth looking into? The woman hooked her thumb behind her at a person in a booth on the other end of the restaurant. It was the man in the ponytail and sunglasses. You see that guy? That's Thad Newberry, Wallace P. Gross's literary agent. What's he doing here? JJ asked. He checked in the day before Wallace was shot, paid in cash, and was super cagey anytime someone tried to make small talk with him. What I'm thinking is that Wallace was hunting for the treasure of John Henry Grand instead of writing a book. And you think Thad has something to do with that treasure? asked JJ. Let's say your ticket to wealth just all of a sudden stops providing and he starts telling you about some great treasure he's on the hunt for. Then maybe you come up here and see for yourself that yes, he's on to the real deal. But what if you start getting greedy and decide to take the money for yourself? The conversation that Marcella and Thad were having last night, exclaimed Valentine. What? she asked. When we found the secret passageway, we followed it down to a vent that overlooked the ballroom. Thad and Marcella were there, and neither of them looked happy. Thad said that if they could lay low, then they'd make it out fine. That's an angle to explore, said the young woman. Maybe Marcella and Thad were in league with each other. Hmm, said JJ. It is funny that they'd both be up here at the same time, but could they kill if it came down to it? Could be possible, said Valentine. Wallace calls up two private eyes and looks like he's about to blab. Maybe they panic and take things into their own hands rather than risk the info getting into the wrong hands. So you'll help me? She asked. Wait, said JJ. Who even are you? The woman sat up straight and smoothed down her Grand Chateau uniform. Trudy De La Rosa, front desk receptionist and inquisitive person. Well, I'm flattered, Trudy De La Rosa, front desk receptionist and inquisitive person, but the Ghost Hunters Adventure Club is closed for business this weekend. JJ. Valentine said, come on. Valentine, my dear brother, can you join me for a quick Ghost Hunter Adventure Club official sidebar conversation? Valentine sighed. Fine. They ducked under the booth and spoke in whispers out of earshot from Trudy. One, this is dangerous, said JJ. Two, I was so much happier when all I had to worry about was breakfast. 
You said yourself there wasn't a payday in this gig, but now there's treasure. I want to solve this case, and I know you want the loot. So now we both have skin in this game. JJ thought for a moment. Probably about the private island he'd buy if he somehow amassed untold riches. Fine. You know the way to my greedy little heart. But how do we know? How do we trust Miss Know It All up there? I think she's telling the truth. She could be waiting to explode our heads herself. The Ghost Hunters Adventure Club would outsmart her before that happens, said Valentine, taking into account the fact that they had never cracked a case before, but also that JJ had a large ego. You're right, replied JJ. He sighed. Are we actually going to try to solve this mystery? Only if we solve it together. The brothers popped up from under the table. Congratulations, Trudy De La Rosa, said JJ. My brother and trusted advisor has convinced me to offer you a provincial membership into the Ghost Hunters Adventure Club. Provisional membership entitles you to a junior detective title and a Ghost Hunters Adventure Club branded decoder ring. It does not allow you to know the secret handshake. What? replied Trudy. Join your club? I just came to you two with all this information I had figured out on my own and you want me to be your junior detective? If anything, you two should be working for me. JJ snorted. I'd like to see whatever crime-solving and ghost-hunting business entity you've formed. You two are idiots. We're two idiots that you need because we're the only people on this mountain stupid enough to believe what you're telling us enough to investigate it further. You want help figuring this out, you gotta play by our rules. Trudy tried to reply, but the logic of JJ's last sentence was half-baked enough to leave her at a loss for words. Now before we get ahead of ourselves, let's discuss terms. JJ grabbed a paper napkin and scribbled on it with a pen. How does a 40-40-10 split sound to everyone? That's only 90%, said Trudy. Come on, JJ, don't do this, said Valentine. One day a legally binding contract written on a napkin will save your life. You mark my words. But fine. JJ crumpled the napkin, then grabbed a new one. Trudy, your friend drives a hard bargain on your behalf. How about we do a three-way split of revenue? Okay, Trudy agreed. Less expenses, of course. I'd really like to buy that motorcycle kickstand back. Sure. Then it's settled, said JJ, signing the napkin and passing it around the table for counter signatures. Welcome to the Ghost Hunters Adventure Club. JJ extended his hand and gave Trudy a firm handshake. Valentine clapped politely. So let's plan, said JJ. We gotta figure out who killed Wallace P. Gross and how they did it. Then we gotta find the treasure. As for the killers, I think Marcella and Thad are our prime suspects. Could they have both done it? asked Valentine. Possibly. Or perhaps one could have acted independently of the other. Remember how Marcella was talking to Wallace in the courtyard? It was uncomfortable, Valentine remarked to Trudy. I'm aware. She once called me a ghoulish street harlot when I forgot to bring her an extra shower cap. Over Trudy's shoulder, JJ saw Thad finishing up his breakfast. He scanned the small group of restaurant patrons to find Marcella on the other end of the room, wearing black, watching her tea get cold from behind her sunglasses. I think we can find out more if we tail our two friends here. What would they have for us other than a confession? asked Valentine. The fact that the locks were broken on Wallace's desk drawers rings alarm bells, said Trudy. There's a missing manuscript on the loose, and I think they might know the whereabouts. We know that they were both out late and together last night, Valentine stated, and that the door to Wallace's study was unlocked. They could have grabbed it easily. Right, said JJ. So I think the next logical step would be to watch these two from afar and see if we can find out where they stashed it. Deputy Park is on patrol, though, said Valentine. You're right, and the heat's high on us. JJ directed his attention to Trudy. All right, newbie, looks like you got yourself your first field mission. Trudy rolled her eyes. Just tell me what I gotta do. I'm glad you asked, said JJ. He reached into his satchel and pulled out a hardcover book, handing it to Trudy. The Ghost Hunters Adventure Club Field Manual? I had them printed at a vanity press and bought enough to get a wholesale markdown. I figure once the detective business picks up, this will be an amazing ancillary revenue stream. JJ flipped to the chapter titled Tailing a Perp. Give this thing a read and take notes. There's a short quiz at the end of the chapter, as well as a word jumble that should help you out. But the gist of it is this. Keep a safe distance from your target and don't arouse suspicion. You work at this hotel and you have the uniform, so you should be relatively... You should have relatively free row of the grounds, right? Right? Perfect, said JJ, popping one last soft-boiled egg into his mouth. Trudy De La Rosa, you're on the case. It's the end of chapter four. I need to respond to a text real quick. <clears throat> okay. I 
I cannot believe I've been saying cannot incorrectly. Heaping glob is not an appealing phrase. <gasps> Don't beat off. Thank you. Every single book that gal's ever written. What is this? Shocked face. Egg elitus shaking my head. Dude, soft boiled eggs are where it's at. That would have been great in an in, for an eggs benedict joke, yeah. I like breakfast foods. <clears throat> exact same things for breakfast cooked in the exact same way every time. That's funny. I really hate scrambled eggs from powder or whatever it is they use. That's a great game. Everybody wins. Oh, the beating your head against the wall game. Lots of sad lukewarm hot dogs. That's sad. So just lukewarm dogs. Cracking cases overrated. Nothing like that Yoshi music in the background. Imagine being able to fit an entire egg in your mouth. I probably could. What is this? Hi, HS. We're reading a book. Thank you for the claps. 55 months is so many. Holy crap. Thank you. I'm under the impression that Aaron has no idea who Benedict Cumberbatch is, or at least doesn't know anything he's in. I think Aaron is- I think Aaron watches Marvel stuff, though, so it's possible that he does know. But again, I don't know. I don't remember what year the first, um, Doctor Strange came out, so. Okay, I think I have enough energy for like, well, let's see how long this next chapter is. Oh, that's kind of a long chapter. I think I might stop here. I know it's kind of a short stream. I've only been going for like an hour and 20 minutes, but it is 940 and I did work all day. <laughs> um, uh, you know what? I don't got to work tomorrow. I don't got to work tomorrow. We're going one more. We go in one more. 2016 is so plenty of time. Okay. Even stuff he likes he doesn't know tons about. That's true. All right. So here's the picture for chapter five. Okay. Chapter five. The new recruit. Trudy De La Rosa had returned to her seat at the reception desk in the lobby of the Grand Chateau. Since the ongoing blizzard prevented new patrons from checking in and old ones from checking out, her job was mainly relegated to fielding fold calls from stir-crazy hotel guests and delivering toiletries to rooms. This only kept her so busy for so long, so she was focusing on her new job, that of being junior detective Trudy De La Rosa of the Ghost Hunters Adventure Club. She had reluctantly read the Tailing a Perp chapter of the field manual twice, aced the test at the back of the chapter, completed the word jumble, and even did a few of the connect the dots puzzles in other chapters. JJ wasn't smart, but he made good connect the dots puzzles. On a trip to take fresh towels to a room on the fourth floor, she spotted Marcella P. Gross at her usual position on the bench in the courtyard near the angel statue. She had somehow endured near whiteout conditions to get to that spot. Trudy couldn't get too good of a read on the woman and what she was doing due to the falling snow, but something about her sagging posture made Trudy deduce that she was sad. She made a note that she would have to research that later. The one person she had trouble finding was Thad Newberry, Wallace P. Gross's longtime literary agent and a man paradoxically in the same location of his client at the time of his death. She noted that he had gone straight to his room after breakfast and to her knowledge, after repeated checks, he had not exited. Maybe it was time for another re reconnaissance mission. Trudy set the Ghost Hunters Adventure Club field manual under her desk and looked around to see that neither Madame Fournier nor any of the co few co-workers stuck up here were paying too much attention. If anyone stopped her, she could just say that she was making her rounds. The Watts brothers were right. This uniform was the perfect cover. She rounded the lobby, searching for any clue of Thad's whereabouts, peeking into the restaurant to find nothing. The bar was nearly empty, perfectly reasonable for the early afternoon shift at the chateau. She thought for a moment about interrogating the bartender to see if she could shed any light on Thad's motives. He was a nightly fixture at that bar and had a penchant for talking. Maybe he had let something slip that the bartender had overheard. 
No, it's not the right time for that, she thought. Her nosing around would only arouse suspicion of her at this point. She didn't want the killer knowing she was looking for him. It was best for her to keep a low profile and utilize her eyes and ears. Both of those, coincidentally, were solutions to the connect the dots puzzles in the field manual. With the lobby found clueless, she walked up to the gra she walked up the grand staircase to see if anything had changed from the night before. The door to the study was closed, of course, and she didn't want to arouse suspicion by snooping around there for clues. Nobody was in the ballroom, and Thad wasn't anywhere to be found in the library, only a few hotel guests dying to pass the time until the blizzard ended and the roads could be plowed. For being a literary agent, Thad didn't seem to be all that dedicated to reading. Just where could he be? Trudy thought back to Thad's check-in. She remembered him complaining loudly about forgetting to bring any of his winter clothes to the hotel, as if she could do anything about it. But that meant there was no way he was outside exploring the grounds. And if he wasn't in any of the public areas, that left only one place for him to be, his own hotel room. Trudy went down the hall into the elevator, riding it all the way up to the fourth floor. The elevator dinged, the doors opened, and she stepped out. Phew, she said, hugging up against a corner wall. She found that making sound effects made her feel like a better detective. Peering around the corner, she saw Thad Newberry's suite, room 524, all the way at the end of the long hallway. It was time to make her move. She tiptoed the 29 steps to Thad Newberry's room, adding her own soundtrack to the mission as she went along. Past the windows overlooking the courtyard, past the stairwell that could lead her back down in a pinch, and all the way to the very end of the hallway where she picked up a noise coming from Thad's room. The closer she got, the louder it got. Was it a conversation? That doesn't seem like Thad's voice, she thought. Who could be talking to him right now? Is there even anyone else in the hotel he associates with? Maybe he met someone at the bar last night and they're conspiring right now. She stifled the urge to squeak. No time for sound effects now, it's not safe enough. She checked over her shoulder in case any culprits had snuck up behind her. The carpets were plush and it would have dampened any sound, but nobody was there. Chancing it, she leaned her ear against the door to hear the conversation as clear as day. Sports. Thad Newberry was watching a sports program on TV. Aw, oh, man, Trudy said under her breath. Thad spending his day watching TV would not help the investigation get any further. Dejected, she turned around and slinked back toward the elevator, making sure to create the correct whomping footstep sound effects to denote failure. Passing the window, she decided to do one last check on Marcella P. Gross to ensure that her location had not changed. Peering down below to the courtyard, she spotted the familiar black fleck moving through the still howling storm. She's on the move! Suspect on the move! Alarm bells were ringing inside Trudy's head. She had to get to the bottom floor of the Grand Chateau so she could follow the movements of her subject. Deciding in that split moment that it was faster, she dashed for the stairwell at the opposite end of the hallway near the elevator. Trudy made a racket descending all five floors down the echoing stairwell and would have burst out of the door in a noisy huff had she not remembered that the exit was right next to Madame Fournier's office. Trudy froze when her feet hit the first floor landing. She caught her breath, smoothed out her uniform, and exited the stairwell with the grace and care of an exemplary Grand Chateau employee. The coast was clear. Thankfully, no Madame Fournier in sight. Trudy peered across the lobby at the entrance to the courtyard where Marcella Pigros should be. She barely caught a glimpse of black, expensive fur pass around the corner. Trudy did her most graceful, fastest walk across the library. Lob library? Lobby. Where could the perp be heading? Rounding the corner, she caught another dash of black fur entering the elevator. Ah, nuts, Trudy said. She speed walked back to the stairwell. Marcella P. Gross, Marcella P. Gross, she repeated, trying to jog her memory. What room are you staying in? Her memory came back to her in a flash. Marcella P. Gross, room 419. Trudy had checked her in a week before Wallace died at 1225 in the afternoon. Marcella had remarked that Trudy's uniform was tacky and boorish, suggesting that she let her manager know for the sake of the rest of the hotel patrons who must have been too embarrassed to mention anything. 419, that's where she must be going. But Trudy had to be sure. As soon as she got into the stairwell, she darted up the stairs as fast as she could. She made it to the door to the second floor and burst out of it, looking toward the elevator banks. She saw Marcella's elevator. She saw the floor indicator above it, a small arrow turning in a radian from left to right. The arrow reached the second floor, the number two lighting up. Ding! The arrow kept moving. She was still going up. Trudy dashed up the steps to the third floor, rammed through the door, and shot her gaze over to the elevators. Ding! Trudy ran back up the stairs, her heart racing faster now. Fourth floor. Ding! Here was the make it or break it floor. Trudy let the adrenaline propel her upward as she made it up another flight of stairs. She opened the door just in time for the elevator to pass. Ding! Trudy's thoughts raced. 
There was one more floor, and Marcella didn't keep company with anyone else at the hotel other than Thad Newberry and Wallace P. Gross deceased. Logically, Trudy had to conclude that the only place Marcella could be going was Thad Newberry's room. But again, she had to be sure. Trudy ra turned to race up the last flight of stairs. Her heart screamed as she took the steps two by two, summoning her last bits of strength to make it to the final floor of the Grand Chateau in time. Chest heaving, Trudy De La Rosa burst through the door to the hallway and bounced off the rotund belly of Deputy Jihun Park, knocking the wind out of herself when she landed on the floor. Oh, said Deputy Park. He bent down to help her up. Deputy Park, whether he knew it or not, was blocking Trudy's eyeline to the elevator banks. She heard a ding. At least she thought she did. Her ears buzzed from exertion and it felt like someone was slicing a cold knife through her lungs. She tried her best to angle herself better so she could see down the hallway, but the deputy seemed genuinely concerned for her well-being. Say, said the deputy, what are you doing running up these stairs? Trudy's heart somehow found a way to beat even faster. Her brain screamed for an alibi, anything. Come on, Trudy, you always have a plan. I, um, I like to get a little workout in during my breaks. It keeps me healthy. This was the most physical exertion Trudy had endured in her 18 years of life. Park laughed. Oh, what a fun idea. It's really important for youngsters like yourself to keep a healthy body as well as a healthy mind. Trudy nodded politely, trying her hardest to keep her breathing under control. She kept trying as inconspicuously as possible to see around the deputy, but his good-natured talkativeness kept getting in the way. What's your workout routine like? He asked. I'm always looking for pointers myself. Trudy thought she caught a glimpse of a fur coat walking down the hallway. It must be Marcella P. Gross. Mrs. Park is always on my case to drop a few pounds. In a perfect world, I would start my morning with a proper stretching routine, followed by 20 each of squats, lunges, and push-ups. Deputy Park went on. In a perfect world, of course. Trudy's mind went into deduction mode. There was a mustard stain on Deputy Park's left lapel and breadcrumbs in the fibers of his uniform. He'd had a turkey sandwich for lunch. His mustache was waxed. He cared about his appearance and must carry wax on his person since he wasn't aware that he'd be staying the night here. One of the buttons on his uniform was mismatched. It must have been tailored recently. Trudy worked over the information in her mind in a matter of milliseconds. Every moment counted. She had to see if Marcella was going into Thad's room. Your, um, your shoes untied? If she could have smacked her forehead without arousing more suspicion, she would have. Oh, said Deputy Park. He bent down to address his shoelaces. When he kneeled on the chateau's carpet, Trudy was able to see all the way down the hallway. There she was, Marcella P. Gross. She waited nervously at the door to room 524, Thad Newberry's suite. The door opened slightly and the woman quickly slid behind it, glancing over her shoulder as she went. It was then that Trudy and Marcella locked eyes. The door closed as quickly as it opened and Trudy heard the deadbolt lock from all the way across the hallway. False alarm, said Deputy Park. Guess they were tied after all, but I made sure to double knot them just in case. I think my break time's just about up, Trudy said. It was really nice talking to you, deputy. She moved to make a hasty exit down the stairwell. Hold on a second, said the deputy. Trudy froze in place. There was a commotion last night sometime around midnight. You wouldn't happen to know anything about that, would you? Um, no, I'm not sure what you're talking about. I spoke to Madame Fournier today and she told me that you should have been the one running the night desk, only no one was there. If you weren't at your desk, then where were you? Trudy turned to look into the deputy's eyes. The friendliness was gone. I was getting my night stares in. Oh, said the deputy, and he immediately relaxed. Nothing wrong with a little nighttime exercise. Do make sure you cool down before you go to bed, though. And also be careful around here when you're on your own. The investigation's still ongoing, and some people are trying to convince me that the real culprit is a ghost with a gun. Trudy nodded politely again. Once she was on the other side of the stairwell door, she released a huge sigh of relief and gripped the railing for support. It took her a while for her heart rate to return to normal. She had to tell the brothers about Marcella P. Gross's rendezvous. There is something fishy going on in that hotel room, J.J. Watts said. He paced around the bedroom suite he had secured. No duh, replied Trudy. Valentine turned off the TV. Trudy was leaning against the door to the suite. So we got two people acting suspiciously, he said, telling each other late at night that they can't be seen together, and then meeting in the middle of the day as inconspicuously as possible. She caught me looking when she went in, said Trudy. I'm worried she might think I'm suspicious of something. So what do we do? asked Valentine. What we do is break into Thad's room while he's away and conduct a thorough search, JJ decided. Trude, you gotta have an extra key to his room, right? I mean, I would if it weren't for the fact that all the extra keys are in Madame Fournier's office. She'd find out the moment I tried to lift them. 
Got it, said JJ. Guess we're back to breaking and entering. Trudy, you're still on front desk duty, right? Not for much longer. I'm supposed to be doing my mid-afternoon stairs right now. What? That's not important, but yes, I'm off in time for dinner. Perfect. All right, Trudy, you're our eyes and ears on the field. At some point, Thad Newberry will leave his room for dinner, and Marcella P. Gross will presumably go off to some dark corner of the chateau to brood. When that happens, give us a call. Valentine, you're on distraction duty. I hate distraction duty, said Valentine. I know you do, but we're trying to get some character growth in you. It's when you put yourself out of your comfort zone that you learn about yourself. Plus, the other part of the plan is the breaking and entering, and I know you hate that more. True. But what do I do if Thad starts heading back up to his room? I don't know. Pitch him a book idea or something. He's a lit agent, after all. Trudy, I'll only need a few minutes to search Thad's room, but I can do it twice as fast with you there. What do you say, cadet? You in? Please stop calling me cadet. Splendid. All right, team, let's do this. Trudy, I'm going to need you to turn around for a second so Val and I can do a secret handshake. But do good on this mission and maybe you too will get to learn it. Okay, that's the end of chapter five. I didn't even have a chance to get this. <laughs> that is very late sunset. My wife, where can she be? Thank you for shouting out HS. Library. <laughs> New library pronunciation just dropped. My first job was at the library. <laughs> Ding! Be in the hotel elevator. Could you hit the L for me? I want to go to the library. <laughs> I, I don't know why my brain wanted to say library when the book said lobby. That's why that happened. <laughs> Me climbing upstairs, heart screams. Imagine past V working in the hotel and we find her on break running up and down the stairs. I have done that. Kicking mice all the way. There's something fishy in snake horrors that hotel room. Do we know Peanut Butter Beagle? I don't know. I don't think I know that name. Thank you for the claps. Okay, so I think that's where I'm going to stop tonight. Um, but thank you guys very much for joining me. I had a really fun time. I really am enjoying this book. Thank you again to Tara for giving me this. I think for Christmas, was this Christmas or my birthday? One of the two. Um, so either way, I really appreciate it. Um, thank you for the gift. I'm really, really having a fun time with it. It's very funny. I should not be trusted to work in a hotel. I worked in a hotel for 11 and a half years and... I don't really miss it, to be honest. <laughs> um, but anyway, I would swim in the pool and ride up and down the elevators. Uh, I didn't really swim in the pool, but I did ride the elevators a lot. I'm glad you enjoyed it. I enjoyed it too. Oh, thank you for the follow. <clears throat> QC Hawkeye in Florida. Thank you so much for the follow. I hope you're having a wonderful night. Um, I hope you guys have a great rest of the night. I don't know when I'll stream again. This happens every time. Oh no, did you follow at the end? Well done first time. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I hope you guys have a wonderful rest of the night. Uh, take care of yourselves. I'm not sure when I'll be able to stream again. Potentially Wednesday. Um, I have some things I gotta get done tomorrow, so I don't think I'll have time to, to squeeze in a stream. Um, but I may try to do that Wednesday, so hopefully then. Oh, no, it's usually mispronounced. Oh, oh, you're your username. I just had to look at it for a second and then I was good. Um. <laughs> uh, anyway, I hope you guys have a wonderful night. Please take care of yourselves. Um, it was wonderful to meet you new friends. So please come back and say hello to us. Um, and uh, I hope to see you again soon. Um, until then, much love and I'll catch you next time. Bye-bye.